I will give you a presentation. And, um, oh good, it's up. And this one is called Beyond User Research. Because you know, if you put beyond in front of anything, well, your consulting rates will go up. Trust me on this. Okay, so um, this guy, uh, I'm gonna miss him. We've only got a few months to go, but uh, I'm gonna play a clip from uh, right after uh, the US um, uh, healthcare program launched and the website didn't go so well. Uh, this seems almost like ancient history, but we don't have this smooth running operation with our government web infrastructure like you seem to in this country. So let me play you uh, a clip from back then in November of 2013. Example of this, by the way, just to use an analogy. Um, when we came into office, we heard a lot of complaints about the financial aid forms that families have to fill out to get federal financial aid. Uh, and I actually remember applying for some of that stuff and remember how difficult and confusing it was. And Arnie Duncan over at Education worked with a team to see what we could do to simplify it and it made a big difference. Uh, and that's part of the process that we've got to go through. And in fact, uh, you know, if we can get some focus groups and, and we sit down with actual users and Woo! see you know, how, how well is this working? What would improve it? What, what part of it didn't you understand? That, that all, I think, uh, is part of the, uh, what we're going to be working on uh, in the weeks ahead. This guy. <laughs> all right. I mean, way to go. I mean, it took a disaster <laughs> to remember, oh, well, well, with um, the financial aid stuff, we, we, we were working on it. I guess we could have tried that here. And, I'm not so sure about the focus group part, but then his heart's in the right place. And this is fantastic when the leader of the free world, as we style him, is talking about doing user research. Awesome. Make the forms a little easier to work with. So you're very, I'm very tempted. I don't know about you, but I feel a moment like this is like the we win moment. It's amazing. It's like for those of us, so I'm 51, and I, some of us are even older. Uh -huh. And um, <laughs> we've been working a really long time to get stuff like this to happen in organizations. And I know many of you, uh, feel free to stand up, take a bow. This is a moment for you as well. You've seen something, or moments like this have happened to you, where you see user research is actually happening. It's being done in large organizations, small organizations, medium-sized organizations. And that's fantastic. Uh, it sort of feels like we won the war, um, but what does this victory really look like? I mean, this is maybe not the war, but it's a battle along the way. We have all these organizations. They are spending money on user research, but what's really happening out there uh, in these environments? Well, um, I don't do a lot of consulting anymore, but I know when I have in the past few years, and certainly many people I talk to, this is, and many people who work within large organizations sort of depict the environment of user research as looking kind of like this. First of all, there are lots of things like this. Post-it notes that come out of uh, different uh, uh, studies that are done by user research groups. It may be uh, people that come from HCI, uh, other areas as well. They're using methods that are very familiar to the people in this room, and that's great. Uh, so a lot of that stuff happening. In fact, it's happening often in different parts of an organization. It may be a bit distributed. OK. But there's other stuff. So uh, when I used to do uh, consulting, um, I would always ask for search analytics, because that's like my favorite user research toy. And um, they usually stare at me, those uh, user researchers who brought me in. They didn't know what I was talking about. Or if they did, where do, I, where do, where do we get that? Who do we even know to talk to in an organization that would have access to search logs? So that's another kind of stuff that's out there. I also often find myself uh, back in the day asking for uh, the logs from call centers. And I remember one client took me nine months, took them nine months to find me the logs from the call centers. And that was just the raw stuff without having the, the calls, uh, uh, the, uh, the communications with the customers uh, cataloged in any way. So that's more stuff out there in the organization. And there's even more research going on. There's, uh, all the various analytics applications and all the stuff that 
all the data and knowledge that those applications are throwing off. Um, in a lot of organizations, somewhere else, there's voice of the customer research happening, which is a bunch of different people operating a bunch of different methods and tools to, to learn something else about what customers and users want. In other organizations, there are other parts of the organization, we see uh, the CRM tools starting to throw off some interesting knowledge about people who interact with our organizations and our products. And uh, uh, many of you are familiar with MPS as another tool that may be run by yet a different group of people inside the same organization, also teaching us something interesting. Um, a lot of organizations are big enough to have research centers that have a lot of really interesting information, often uh, pulled together by people with PhDs after their names. And that's interesting stuff too, but again, many different approaches, many different tools that are being used, and that lives somewhere else inside the organization typically. I've often like had this weird experience of seeing the methods that are used in <laughs> books that I publish uh, out there in organizations. I had one client, uh, uh, I had been working with him for months, and I was walking down the hall, and I see a war room. And uh, on the wall is a giant mental model map based on the Indie Young book on <laughs> mental models. And I was like, you could have told me. I could have, I could have used this months ago. Another organization, sometimes um, you'll see organizations doing user research you've never heard of, like something called brand architecture. How many of you are familiar with brand architecture? A couple of you. I'm impressed. I had never heard of it before. So like people who look at uh, uh, research through the lens of brand and create whole architectures based on brand and brand attributes and so forth. It was really interesting. They had their own methods. And in, in this case and in many other cases, the research is being done by a completely different third party. So we bring in agencies to do different types of user research. So there's a lot of research going on. It's really kind of hard to keep track of. We're spending a lot of money on that research. We're using a lot of different tools. We've got a lot of different types of brains that are pulling together that research, and yet, <coughs> it's terrible, right? Wait, I mean, what's, where's the return on investment for all the research that we've been doing? The millions and millions of dollars or pounds or whatever currency you're spending in, are you really getting the return that you should as an organization? for all this work. So hey, great, we're spending the money. We won that battle, but are we really seeing the return? Have we really gotten anywhere? Why is it so bad? Well, I love this fable. You guys are familiar with this, I'm sure. It's kind of an implausible idea that a bunch of blind men are walking around unattended in a jungle, perhaps, because they come upon an elephant. And uh, you know how it goes. One of the blind man touches the trunk and says, oh, we found ourselves a snake. Another one touches uh, the leg and says, no, 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 it's a tree. That's the tree trunk, and so forth. So we have all of these different kinds of people in our organizations having a similar experience. You know, the people from analytics see one type of truth, and the people from uh, the HCI group see a different type of truth, and the marketing Research, the market researchers see another kind of truth. But nobody sees the whole truth. Nobody actually is really putting it all together. No one is doing the synthesis that we really need in order to achieve any type of insight, of substance, any type of kind of ground-shaking, game-changing insight that would really make a difference for those organizations. Well. Why is that? Well, we haven't really put it all together. And it's partly because we see all these various types of user research as almost being in opposition to each other. Some of us are really interested in the what. We look at behavioral data, for example, and we can get a really good picture of what is going on when people interact, let's say, with our website or our products. Some of us, many in this room, are really good at the why part. We're not so good at necessarily crunching the data, but we're really good at coming up with questions that go a little deeper and that require a different view, a different perspective, and often a completely different tool set. Some of us are, as um, Angel was talking about yesterday, are really 
kind of keyed in on the whole qual side of things, and we may do things like field studies, and we're, we're very comfortable doing that sort of thing. And the same people are often very uncomfortable with the quant side. I mean, this, there's a couple jokes buried in, in this uh, image here, but there's a bit of truth to it. It's different kinds of brains, really, with, with different comfort levels. There's a reason some of us go into some fields and not in others. We feel really uncomfortable with the numbers, so we're going to stay on this side, on the qual side, or vice versa. Some of us are really uh, are, are, are charged to focus on the goals of our organizations. We're really thinking about the KPI. Others, as, uh, others of us are kind of really more focused on the users. What do they want? Sometimes those things are not in alignment. And so uh, we, we often feel the, the need to kind of counterbalance uh, one of these things. If one seems too important to the organization, maybe they're too focused on organizational goals, maybe we need to counterbalance it with uh, really advocating for the users, or maybe even vice versa. Some of us um, are using data to understand the known world better. We're using the, the research that we do in some cases, not just to confirm what we know, but to also measure it over time and monitor it, that reality and how it may be changing in, in usually small, steady ways. Others of us are more comfortable learning about the unknown from the data that we pull together. You can look at the same data and get two different things. You might see the things you expected to see, but you also might see some interesting surprises. Does the same person do that? Do they have the same mindset for that? Maybe, maybe not. It also depends on what they were charged to do with that information. Are they in the business of creating a weekly report from that same data? Are they given the opportunity to look beyond that weekly report and take a fresh look at it? You may not even be able to do that if you've been working on generating the same type of report on a regular basis. So you may have the, the mind that's capable of it, but you've been so conditioned not to look beyond the known that you're not even really capable of it anymore. We have those different comfort zones. S statistical data might seem like a truth that really means something to us. Right now in the US, many of us have a certain uh, syndrome. It's going to 538.com and checking the polling data and hopefully feeling good about what we see. And it goes up and down, and sometimes it's really uncomfortably close, like just a few weeks ago, and sometimes it's not. And we want to see those trends, and we look for truth in, in certain types of data. Sometimes the same types of people look at the, the more of the, the descriptive data, the rich data that has maybe more semantic meaning, where the truth may not be so clear, but there's a certain security and understanding that maybe there's a bit more nuance to reality. And so we're, we find different types of data, either appeal to different kinds of people or even to the same person, depending on their need. So we have a lot of dichotomies, and we tend to see these dichotomies as opposed to each other. Well, you're a web analytics person, and I'm a, a user researcher with an HCI background. Can we really work together? Can we even have a conversation with each other? We know that's not so easy. But I, the problem with dichotomies is that they assume that there's one truth when we really can have multiple truths. In fact, really, we need to see those truths together to have the bigger picture, the ultimate truth. So just to present these side by side, the way a web analytics person and the way a, a kind of a, a basic uh, HCI influence UX person might see the world, uh, again, this is quite overgeneralized. But how, what we analyze, you know, some of us are looking at uh, behavioral data. Some of us may be looking at attitudinal data, how do people feel uh, about the realities. The methods we use can vary quite a bit, maybe erring toward quan or qual. Uh, what we're trying to achieve, or we're trying to help our organization succeed, or we may be trying to help our users succeed, and again, those don't always line up. How we use the data, whether we're measuring, or we're trying to sift through and look for patterns and, and new things. And finally, the kind of data we use can vary quite a bit as well. These things are not 
opposed to each other. This is completely and truly a yes and situation. And I think we're at a point now where if we're all confident and secure enough within our organizations that we don't have to worry about budget, that we don't have to think in terms of zero-sum game, that we know that we're not really competing with each other, we're now at a point where we can actually start seeing ourselves as on the same team, as people who can share ideas, who don't have the truth on our own. So if we're at that point, I, I want to give a little bit of guidance to you and anyone who's interested in the subject of how to move forward, because I don't really see a lot of discussion about this. I don't have answers. These four things are really more questions. These four themes are really, I'm going to give you a few thoughts, but I feel like they're kind of big, yawning, gaping questions that we all start needing to, to really get at answering together. Balance, cadence, conversation, and perspective. So let's explore these one by one. And we'll start with balance. So you're a user researcher, or maybe you're someone who cares about user research. It may not be your main job, but you do it to some degree as part of many other one of your many other, uh, various responsibilities. Or you may work with user researchers of one type or another. And you know that um, you're dealing with data. You're dealing with methods and tools. And you're part of a practice. So let's look at these one by one. Um, if we are um, trying to analyze the data we pull together through the user research process, uh, it really helps to take a balanced approach to how we look at that piece of data, that blob of stuff. In other words, can we get different brains to look at it and learn different things from it and then talk with each other? So this is a, a tiny, tiny snippet of uh, a search log. And it comes from um, uh, the state of Washington website where uh, people search for things like how to renew their driver's license. And uh, it's, so, it's just like one of millions of snippets from a particular log that might have happened over the course of uh, even a couple of weeks. And it has some basic information you might expect to see, like an IP address, uh, a time date stamp, and then a search, Linson's plate. And you see at the very, in the next line, it says zero. That was zero search results. And then in the next, um, law, the next blob, just a couple seconds later, they search license plate, and I got 146 results. Now, your brains are all processing this tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of data right now, and I'll bet you you're doing it in very different ways. So if you're a web analytics person, you might be thinking at this and saying, well, are we converting the license plate or the, the, uh, the license plate renewals? Are we doing that right? Are we doing that properly? Uh, obviously, they're misspelling it in the first part. Uh, oh, it's cut off. So let me read the, what the user researcher, how they might look at this. They might say, well, huh, is that what people are searching? What are they searching the most? What are the other things that are really important to them? Is there some sequence to, to the way their searches work? So, you know, there may be a bunch of different questions at a different type of researcher is going to come up with as they look at the same piece of data. I bet you, you know, there's what of 100 people in the room, 150 people in the room, I'll bet you we'd have dozens of questions that come from looking at this tiny snippet of data. And they'd all be good and valid questions. So a balanced approach to how we analyze can come from asking different types of people to look at the same stuff. We can also look at our methods from a balanced approach. And I'm really happy that, that uh, I was in Angel's talk yesterday because she had a nice example of a persona, um, much nicer than the one I had. So I just updated it with her example. And uh, so this is already familiar to you if you were here yesterday. A basic persona. You know, This is kind of something that uh, a lot of um, UX people rely on. Uh, but what's not really in here is anything very statistical or quantitative. And that's why they added uh, this other information to a persona. It's interesting, right? Because when you are here and you present this method to colleagues who share different ideas of research or different tools or approaches or methods, they may say, this looks like something that's just a piece of fiction. How can I take this seriously? 
ah, now I take it seriously. <laughs> so can we look at our methods more critically and from a balanced perspective so that they have more utility or at least credibility? This is like the ugliest thing in the world and it's like my favorite slide. Uh, in the world. I, I use it probably in every presentation I've given in the last five years or so. Regardless of what I'm speaking about, I try to work it in. And uh, it's Christian Rohrer's uh, Landscape of User Research Methods. He, he published the original one and then a, an update a couple of years ago in uh, the, the Nielsen Norman site. Uh, oh, Jacob's thing, useit.com, uh, his newsletter. Uh, I won't hold that against him. Um, so it's a little cut off, but I'll read it for you. Uh, I'm just blowing it up a little bit. What he's done is he's taken the various uh, user research tools and methods that make up the canon that many of us are familiar with, and he's plotted them on two axes. It's cut off, but it says behavioral and attitudinal. And the other axis is qualitative and quantitative. And so he's mapped these various tools and done some categorization of those tools. Wow, that's fantastic. Why is that so fantastic? All right, let me count them many ways. Um, you might take something like this and think about your practice. Does your practice have balance? Are all the tools and methods that you use squished into one of these quadrants? Or are they spread evenly? If they're not, well, what you can do is use this as a diagnostic tool to actually have a more balanced approach to the work you do. If you're only sampling from one of these quadrants, you're only like, you've got like the same kind of blind man looking at the elephant. He's only touching one part of the elephant, and so the others. They're, not, they're only touching the trunk. They're not touching the, 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 um, the legs or the tail or, the, or the, the torso or anything like that. So uh, as a diagnostic tool, as a tool to understand the reality of what kind of research you are doing as an organization, and just to have a balanced practice, I really recommend um, that you take a look at this chart. And we'll return to it a little later. So um, balance, a lot of ways to look at balance. I covered in terms of a specific tool or method, in terms of a, a practice, and in terms of the way you look at data. What about this idea of cadence? This is a, a, a a diagram that Whitney Quisenberry, who's, who's written a couple of books for us, uh, put together. And I really like what she's done here because it's visually quite simple. She's taken just a handful of different user research methods on the left side and plotted them out over time. So as you can see, there's an actual cadence there with certain things happening very quickly. You know, like uh, doing different types of log analysis. Whereas on the other end of the spectrum, there are other things that take longer and happen less frequently, like field studies. So if we only had uh, in our cadence things that were like uh, field studies, um, would we be getting the right picture of reality? I mean, you, it's nice to get that sort of long, deep look. But you might miss something that you would get from those quick rat a tat a tat a tat looks, like something like uh, log analysis might give you. And conversely, uh, if you're only looking at those quick, you're taking those quick sips on a regular basis, you're missing out on something deeper, potentially. So in effect, this is a, a, another form of balance, only balancing of time, balancing of cadence. Now, you can actually put uh, a, a cadence together. Uh, this is just a stab at one that looks along these lines, where um, there may be things that you try to do on a weekly basis. That's the rat-a-tat-a-tat -tat stuff. Uh, maybe there are certain things that you do on a quarterly basis. There may be other things you do annually. A lot of this might be a function of your budget. Some of the things you're going to do annually are probably things that are more expensive. Now, you could actually think about putting this type of menu together with the balance that we were talking about earlier from Christian Rohrer's diagram. So, hmm. If we're looking at things on a kind of quick, quick, quick weekly basis, can we get some balance there in terms of uh, looking at quantitative versus qualitative stuff? 
looking at attitudinal versus behavioral stuff. Those are those, those axes on his diagram. Can we have the same kind of balance in the quarterly uh, cadence? Can we have the same kind of balance in the annual cadence? So can we get a pretty balanced look over time and with different types of tools and generating different types of data over the course of any given period of time? I think you get a better picture of reality when you do that. So it's not just sending a bunch of different blind men to touch different parts of the elephant, but doing it in a way all the time, night, day, different, over different kinds of weather, different seasons, different conditions. Because reality is changing all the time. And you have to have a timed cadence in order to really understand reality. Next of the four themes, the idea of conversation. Um, so it's not just having a nice bunch of tools and methods that cross different uh, tribal boundaries. You know, you have your web analytics approach, and, and she has her uh, HCI approach, and so forth. But it's getting you and her to talk, to actually share information. And that's often the hardest part inside our organizations, partly because of the scale of our organizations, partly because of the complexity and incentive structures and so forth. I can't solve that for you, but I can give you a couple of ideas to get things started in a couple stories. Um, first of all, if you're talking about communication, talking about sharing, one of the real problems we face in UX and areas like it is that we're new fields that are multidisciplinary, so by definition, we've thrown people together that are different, and as you would expect, we often don't speak the same language. And if you can't speak the same language, you're going to get nowhere, no matter what your incentives, your motivations, if you sit in the same room, around the same table, it really won't matter. You have, half the battle is getting, giving people a common vocabulary. One way to do that, to almost to think of developing a pigeon, a pigeon language, that different people from different backgrounds who use different tools can use, is to look for what Dave Gray and others call boundary objects, things that are maybe the same or pretty close, although you may call it something different than I call it. So the idea, for example, of uh, uh, you may use the term KPI, I may use the term goals. We may kind of mean the same thing. And if we can start seeing them as kind of the same thing and understanding what each other mean, we'll, we'll get through the, the nuanced differences, but we'll have, in effect, some common vocabulary. If you talk about personas and I talk about segments, again, yes, they're not exactly the same, but there's something in common. So those are boundary objects. And, and actually, I like Dave's thinking there. I'm sorry that the URL is cut off. I'm not really sure what's going on with our um, picture here. Um, but uh, he's taken the idea and blown it up into something called the boundary matrix. You could search for that and find that pretty easily, boundary matrix, where you're putting boundary objects together and seeing them collectively, which gives them even greater meaning, because now you're actually starting to get the sense of a common vocabulary when you see them in one place together. Okay, so the idea of starting to think about words that we can use in common is powerful. There's also the words that we shouldn't use. So because we all come from different tribes, we come bearing different language. And often that language is, is dangerous and harmful and actually should be banned. Why? Not because I'm a, a neo-fascist who believes in ba banning language, but because a lot of the terminology we use in our tribes is so burdened with baggage of meaninglessness that it becomes damaging. So. Uh, if I'm talking about um, information architecture, which I purportedly know a lot about, suddenly, if you're not really that aware of information architecture or terms like it, you're, you're, you may be frozen because you don't get me. You're like, well, what's it? Well, hold on, hold on. I, well, he lost me. Or you may feel like I'm using jargon, and so now I'm coming off as the member of some other priesthood. There's a whole host of things that happen when we use jargon. And a lot of that jargon could come from not only disciplines, but the marketing departments of the tools that we use, or other types of sources. Uh, here's one that I've uh, I found to be pretty interesting, Portal. I don't hear it much anymore, but it still comes up again and again. Uh, 
And what do we mean? What is that? But I hear people talking about things like that. And so they basically obscure actually having meaningful conversations because those words are actually often completely meaningless. What language do you use that has very little meaning? What language do you use that you take for granted? What language do you use that's jargon? Can you identify a language like that and ban it from conversations that you have with your colleagues? Or ask them. Give them permission to do it. I've actually run a number of meetings that were interdisciplinary where I said there's certain terms we're not going to use because they don't, because I know whenever I talk about information architecture, for example, with people who aren't IAs, they get kind of sweaty and they don't, they stop understanding me. So if I use that term, I'm going to throw a dollar in, into the middle of the table. Let's come up with other terms that get in the way of understanding. And if we use those terms, we keep throwing dollars or, or whatever in the middle of the table. And you'll see the nature of the conversation changes in a really good way when you stop using these words. So think about the words that get you nowhere, that you've used as crutches that no longer have meaning, and get them out of the conversation. How do things fit together um, in conversations? How do we have better conversations? Sometimes. Uh, like anything else, we have to have good stories to explain why conversations are, are useful to have with people who are not like us. So I, loved, I like the story, I think Jared Spool gave this to me years ago, about um, Land's End uh, clothing store in the US. It was, it was in the early days of their website. And um, the analytics people were looking through their search logs to see what kind of searches were retrieving zero hits. Because especially if you're an e-commerce play, that's really important to you. And they kept finding these things. SKUs. Wait a minute. These are our SKUs. And they're retrieving nothing. Well, the good news is that was really easy to fix. But they were kind of wondering, why are we seeing this in the first place? Why would anybody search our site for SKUs? They could just search by the product name, whatever. So they talked to people who were running the field study that they would do on a regular basis uh, and asked them to look into this. And the people who uh, ran the field study, what they learned was they went into the homes of Land's End customers, is that the customers had been receiving the printed catalog since the beginning of time. And these were really nice, conventional pieces of inform information systems, basically, that they were familiar with, high-res imagery. And they would leaf through the catalog, find something they liked, and then take that SKU to the website, enter it there, and place the order via the website, because they would rather not interact with the website to browse, but they would rather interact with the website to order, because they didn't like talking to humans calling the 800 toll-free line. So now what you're doing is you're putting together different, radically different methods. The analytics people doing their, their various types of work with, in this case, search on one side, and very different types of people with very different perspectives who gather very different kinds of data, namely ethnographers, on this side. And look how they come together quite nicely. Think about stories like that that you may have seen when you're lucky inside your own organization and use those as models. I like this one. It's another story. Uh, it's about a woman named uh, Samantha Starmer. I think some of you might know her. Uh, she is uh, in New York nowadays um, working at Ralph Lauren, running their customer experience group. But a long time ago, she was at REI uh, in Seattle, in Washington State, back in the US. And um, she was running a, a small user research team and um, felt like you know, they, they were fairly well resourced, but that there was more out there inside the organization that she wanted to learn. And she suspected that the people who were learning other things were, were, were this big group of market researchers across the campus that she uh, knew none of and nobody in common with. So what did she do? 
um, she went around, uh, walked across campus, the REI campus, with bags of candy, knocked on doors, and bribed her way into offices with the offer of a smile and candy and said, can I talk with you? I'm doing something like you're doing, I think, across campus. Could we compare notes? And she did that over time. It wasn't something that happened overnight, but a number of conversations happened, another number of connections were made. Um, eventually, they started having a very informal brown bag series that invited all those different types of researchers, whether they were market researchers or, or user researchers, whatever it might be, to sit together and have pizza and hear about topics that may be of common interest. Community of interest developed, became a community of practice, and eventually became a single research group that was multidisciplinary, all under one umbrella, because she started by bringing candy to strangers. Took a long time, but it's doable. So the fourth theme, what I, um, I call perspective, I, I'm not sure that's the right term for it, so if you have something better, I'm all game. But the idea that you have to be able to see all these different types of research going on and the people doing that research and the tools being used and the, the data that's being thrown off in order to make sense of it. So let's call that perspective. And one way we make sense of spaces of any type, like the one I'm describing, is we map. So this is a map. It's a visual representation of the research that goes on, in, or at least a super set of the research that can go on in many organizations. Now, like, uh, you know, we always look at these early maps from, uh, the, let's say, the age of exploration. And you see how reflective they are of perspective. Or even if we look at the current maps of the world, um, you know, uh, they may be very uh, uh, North Am and South America uh, centric if you look at a map created, let's say, in the States. Or if you ever take a world map and turn it upside down, it makes you really understand the world differently and see the biases of the people who create those maps. Well, we're no different. Christian did a great job with this map, but he's left a lot of things out then it becomes very instructive to look at maps of the world being created by other fields. I present you one. This is by Avinash Kaushik. It's maybe not as mappy, it's, but it is a visual representation uh, by uh, this guy who's one of the leading lights in web analytics, Avinash Kaushik. And he is trying to piece together and make sense of how we understand people from that perspective. And there's some overlap. I mean, he is talking about things like voice of the customer and, and experimentation and testing. But there's some other things here, too, that may be unfamiliar to some of us. And even he acknowledges that this is incomplete and biased. While I have a bucket for voice of the customer, in hindsight, I should have worked harder still to paint the full qual and quant picture. So you know. It's great to see that acknowledgement of incompleteness, and it makes the task a bit more daunting. But can you create a map of how people are understood in your organization? Another way to make sense of things that are disparate is to put them together. So let's call that concept containers, containerization. If you put them in one place, you can understand how they relate to each other a little differently and maybe a little better. For example, um, when I first started putting together this talk a few years ago, um, I knew a bunch of people at MailChimp, which is a mailing list uh, company that's extremely successful, uh, largely because they have a great UX team. And at the time, it was run by Aaron Walter and Greg Bernstein. Um, they. Um, even though they're not like a large organization, um, they were already drowning in different types of uh, data from user research. So um, what they did in order to put this research into a single container is they started using Evernote. And Evernote was kind of a real eye-opening step for them to take. 
Uh, they um, basically, as you see, they had, uh, it was basically, they already had different buckets in effect of, of information coming out of research, namely different types of uh, digital notebooks, 60-ish of them, and they started putting them in one place, namely Evernote. And Evernote uh, does things like it scans uh, things like PDFs for text, and then, then it indexes everything. I know some of you are quite uh, familiar with Evernote. Uh, and um, suddenly, the researchers using this information, not only could they find their own stuff a little bit more easily, so there's some improved organizational memory, but they could find other researchers' stuff that they didn't know existed. Huh. So there's a bunch of reports that use the same terms that I use for my research. That looks interesting. Who's behind that? I need to talk to that person. So they actually started seeing through the process of co-locating the research that there were relationships that were being grown that hadn't grown before between researchers. And that's really a, a, a fascinating step forward that an organization can take when it has this problem of research being disparate and distributed. So um, those kinds of meetings led to a similar thing as what Samantha Starmer saw at REI. They, people were having lunches regularly that didn't do that before based on having Evernote in place. So you might argue that these guys were then on the verge of learning big new things. They were on the, the threshold of synthesis, but um, not quite. Because I talked to them just to, in the last couple months to, to revisit where they were, or where they are, and they're not really, they're kind of stuck, to be honest. They're kind of stuck. They're not really sure what to do next, because while they have this nice big container of stuff that's easy to put their research in, uh, it's limited and limiting in a bunch of ways. Well, um, as I've been talking to companies recently about their efforts in this area, what I'm seeing is a, a, a kind of a cool approach that um, I'd say that the, the best version of is being done at a company called WeWork, which is um, like the biggest co-working, I think they're here too, right, WeWork? Big co-working uh, company. They think, I think they have like 120 locations internationally now. And uh, one of our authors, Tomer Sharon, uh, was uh, lured away from Google uh, a year or so ago to build their, uh, their UX team. And he's a user researcher, so that's a big component of the team he's building. Um, so he's got a blank slate to work with. And it's not, again, a huge company. Um, so a couple of caveats there. But some interesting things are happening. So at WeWork, they're actually putting their information in Airtable. And if you're not familiar with Airtable, it's sort of like database meets spreadsheet in the cloud. Anyone using Airtable? I'm just kind of curious. It's pretty cool. I'll, I'll show you an example in just a moment. Um, Tomer was really concerned about organizational memory. When he was at Google, he saw a lot of problems with uh, not just not knowing what other people were doing, but not remembering what he did a year or two earlier. You forget these things. It's not hard. If you're forgetting it, how is anybody else going to know about it? So there's this issue of an organizational research memory to consider. The other issue that um, is certainly not just an issue at WeWork, but really almost anywhere where user research is happening, is that the really interesting stuff is often locked in reports. And not, it's not that reports are bad. I mean, there's some bad aspects of reports when we get, they become too regular and we stop really paying attention to them. But the, the problem is they are a document, and a document does not equal insight. It doesn't even equal knowledge of any sort necessarily, because it often contains or constricts what's inside and kind of keeps other people from playing with that data and getting some other balanced perspectives on that data. So it locks up the data. So he really wanted to get beyond locking up research information in reports. So what they did was, um, go to a much more finely grained level of granularity with their user research. They called it nuggetization. Um, the primary uh, research that they're doing right now is it's a, it's a bit uh, monocultured, I'll confess. Uh, it's, it's primarily interviews that are captured as either audio or video. And um, they've got something like 350 now, and that's yielded you know, over 3,000 nuggets or observations. They put all that stuff in Airtable. And this is the amazing thing to me. 
especially as, a, uh, as an information architect, um, they have uh, a person doing the curation who's applying something like a dozen different uh, sets of metadata to those nuggets. So they have a full-time curator, full-time information architect, if you will, just going crazy with metadata for these nuggets. So like they have three full-time researchers and one full-time curator for their user research. Uh, that's an amazing ratio, but I think you're going to start seeing this more inside organizations that are enlightened about user research. So that's a screenshot showing what Airtable looks like. And each row is a nugget or observation. And I know you can't really read this, but I will say that the stuff that's blanked out is simply things like URLs. Uh, and then we'd start seeing uh, just lots of metadata to describe each of these little observations, like uh, magnitude, how important is it, uh, like uh, the actor or actors who are involved. So they have this whole metadata uh, set of uh, metadata around who the actors are, whether it's a, a new uh, client or a custodian or uh, someone who works at the, as a community manager or someone who works at the front desk. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And they have um, metadata to describe their five major um, uh, customer journeys, and so each one of these observation fits in customer journeys in a certain way. They have scenes, so they've taken a very dramatic approach. Uh, actors, as I said, frequency, um, and so forth. And all right, so they're just amassing all this stuff about their people and how they interact with WeWork. Um, and then um, when you have a database like that, you can apply uh, an overlay to actually create um, different types of reporting uh, possibilities. So what they've done here is they've, um, they have these insight filters, which basically allow you to manipulate which metadata are important to you. So that's like their, if, it's a, if you're thinking of like something like kayak.com, this is the stuff on the left is how you know, they can filter down. Uh, to the, um, the, op the nuggets that they're interested in. And on the right, um, what you see is an insight. The community team rocks. That's great. How do we know? Well, we've got all, we have 73 observations or nuggets that back us up on that. And if we take a look at it more deeply, uh, the community team rocks, 73 observations. You can actually view the evidence right next to the insight. That's pretty cool. And you can sit down with a decision maker and go through this with them, play back the clips that back this up. So now we're connecting the insights directly with the evidence. And pretty soon, as their decision makers become more aware of how to use a system like this, they can do a little bit more self-service. This can be actually something, actual evidence that decision makers in the organization use. So uh, they may be coming up with their own insights. There's probably some dangers to that too. We can talk about that later. But this to me um, is kind of the state of the art now for putting together user research. They take it and break it down into nuggets. Uh, and by the way, the nuggets don't just have to be uh, interview nuggets. They're going to be pulling together lots of other types of research uh, in different formats, which is what I've been arguing for in this presentation, uh, and put it all in one place. That's pretty cool. And uh, you know, just the idea of connecting the insight directly to the evidence to back it up is, is something that um, makes, um, it really makes the research kind of more real to everyone else. Because you, you really, it's directly backing it up. You cannot miss it. OK, great. So we work. Maybe that's the next stage of this approach to putting things together in containers. And I'm going to take a stab at what the, the, the very next stage might be. Maybe you know, step three might be taking uh, uh, maps and containers and kind of putting them together as dashboards. Uh, it's, you know, like the idea of having different dials and other types of ways of understanding what's going on with your customers and users based on many different types of inputs. It's maybe a cool idea, 
but like every other metaphor, it starts to fall uh, apart fairly quickly because you know, ideally you wouldn't just have these all in one place, but you'd start drawing lines between them to show dependencies. And you might also want to show that there's time dependencies as well. And that's really hard to render visually uh, in almost any way. Uh, it's, I'm not sure dashboards are going to really help us in the long run. But I want to throw it out there that you know, we are kind of starting to move toward the idea of having this kind of control uh, or under, uh, ability to understand large bodies of different types of user research in large organizations. We're inching our way there, but we're making progress. And again, whether it's going to be a, a dashboard or some other metaphor or something we haven't even seen yet remains to be seen. But it's, not, it's very exciting nonetheless. OK. So let's take a step back. Um, I've gotten into the weeds in the last couple of slides. And really what I think we're talking about more and more for people doing user research and people supporting research is a form of operations. And operations is not a sexy term. <laughs> operations is something that a lot of us probably don't want to be involved in. It, it sounds like you're sort of a fancy way of talking about shoveling manure out of a barn. I mean, you know, operations, eh, I don't know. I'd rather be doing research. But if we're going to be doing research inside large organizations, we need the operations to support it and bring all these things together. Well, um, there is a kind of a movement going on right now in organizations around operations. And while operations might not be a sexy term, DevOps is kind of a sexy term. And people are already talking about it as sort of like this evolutionary thing. And I submit to you that um, DevOps, where is maybe where a lot of people are thinking right now and starting to spend on, uh, what about design ops? Uh, my colleague Dave Maluth has been talking about this quite a bit. I I'm just going to take an informal poll. Has anyone heard the term design ops before? Okay, a couple of you. I'm starting to hear it a lot back at back home, and I'm involved in the Enterprise UX conference, so maybe that's not surprising. But that's a term I think you're going to hear more about supporting design operations through things like pattern libraries and design systems, for example. Um, what's next? Research ops. Um, I know people are starting to do this now. They don't have a name for it yet. But doing things like figuring out how to automate recruiting of subjects for studies, that's just one example. Because you have to be able to do that in an organizational setting. Uh, what I think we're kind of on the threshold of is what I would call decision ops. Think about user research for a moment. It's not just about figuring out how to design stuff. It's really about figuring out how to make decisions, how to make good decisions, how to use different types of information, synthesize it, and achieve something like insight. So I think. You know, I think we're going to be doing some kind of operations, all of us in some respect, especially as we get further along in our careers and we're doing less of the tactical stuff and more of the support and planning and strategic stuff. That's going to be some kind of operations in order to make these environments be able to do the kind of stuff that I've been talking about in this session today. So let's blue sky for just a moment. The blue sky um, of how your organization can make better decisions in the future. Just think about it. How can you do a better job? How can you use information, or better yet, let's call it evidence, to make better decisions? I can submit to you that it almost, almost definitely will not look like what you have today. What you have today is most likely more like a dog's breakfast that has organically come together of different kinds of people here and there, using different types of tools here and there, putting together different types of research findings. And that's a nice start, but it doesn't get us anywhere close to insight. So I'll leave you with a few questions. As you think about how you'll get beyond user research, how you'll get to that next battle and hopefully win it, I think there's some things to think about. How are you going to get from making thousands of micro decisions, small things, important, good, but small, to getting to major insight? 
Who's got to be at that table? I don't care that it's, you know, we're talking about a seat at the table. Let's not talk about the big table for a moment at the sea level. Let's talk about the people who are pulling together the information those sea level people need in order to make truly informed decisions. So who do you need to be talking with and whom can you reach out to? Can the four themes that I offered you today help you along the way? And finally, what kind of operations are going to help you get there? I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if anyone knows yet, but I've seen a lot of progress, a lot of steps being made to answering some of these questions. It's early, but we're on the way. And um, I look forward to maybe coming back and giving the same talk with some updates here in London in a few years, getting some of the stories that you've had of successes and maybe even some failures. And um, that's my talk. Thanks very much. Some questions? Yeah, you know, right. They're going to have questions now at the end of the two days when there's probably some beer to be had. But really, um, I'd love to answer questions now because uh, I won't have any voice left by the time I get to the bar. Someone in the back. Um, not to you. Uh, no. Thank you. Just a, just a quick one. Um, with the nuggets, uh, do you lose some of the context around which piece of research it came from? So it reminded me a little bit of like multiple JIRA tickets for a dev team, where then the dev team don't quite do what they perhaps wanted, we wanted them, but you know. So, uh, okay, yeah. And, and I was thinking like, you know, if there's a, if there's a nugget from a, from a massive piece of research, which is really validated and, and when we like, that's a rock solid nugget versus, well, that nugget was taken from someone in a hallway that we didn't really talk too properly. Do you that, see what I mean? That's a really good question. Um, I, it's early uh, for rework to be doing this. I mean, I, I'm sure that could happen, but I can tell you that they're trying really hard to avoid that by just going so crazy with metadata to describe each nugget. So they're describing it not only in terms of its meaning and its semantic value, but they're also describing it in terms of uh, its provenance. Who created it? What was the context? Where was it done? When was it done? Why was it done? Well, you know, why did we do that p piece of research? And so forth. So yeah, I mean, that's, that's great. That's why I don't want to lose, really. You know, so. Yeah, I mean, they really are framing this in terms of, of like, not falling down the hole of losing that organizational memory of research from the very start. And that's one of the reasons why I really like what they're doing. Great question. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? There's another one right there. Um, Charlie? Yeah, thanks. Hi, Lou. Uh, one of your point slides, you said ban words that impede conversations, um, which I totally agree with. But how do you square that in a very competitive design industry where those people that are buying our services kind of expect those words to be used to sort of set that sort of expectation of being credible? So I, what I... I may not be totally getting your question, but what I hear is that there's an expectation, certainly as, as a consultant or an agency, that you are really smart. And to be really smart, that means you use those words. Exactly. Um, I, uh, present company accepted, but this is part of the problem I have with some agencies uh, and that business model. Um, uh, but I think the good agencies actually are very honest about their humanity and about their being uh, one source of intelligence as well as the client at the table. And uh, when I was consulting, I would often take that approach of, you know, I don't have the answer, none of us do, but we have to work together. What are ways we can work together? Well, we can have better conversations. Here are some tips on how. So, that was always my approach. I found it to be very effective. Um, and it requires consultants to kind of come down from that pedestal and not take the role of a member of the priesthood. That's actually more on you than on the client. That's more uncomfortable for you, but it's going to serve you well in the long run. And you may lose some clients, but they're probably clients that you probably mm, weren't going to be wanting to work with in the long run anyway. 
Alberta. Can I? Um, I can repeat your question for for uh, you. It's not a question, but I wanted to sure. further what Charlie was saying over there and tell a little story. When I was in the States, I was consulting for the Center for Disease Control. So it's U.S. government. It doesn't get more formal than that. And we had a, so you come in as a consultant, and you're expected to use the big words and create that power imbalance that confuses everybody. So the client throws acronyms at you, you throw big words, and nobody understands anybody, and big bucks fly. <laughs> we had this client at CDC who could not remember the word wildfire. And so for 18 months, we sent emails, had phone calls, and meetings about chicken wire. <laughs> and we all agreed that chicken wire meant wildfire. Chicken were harmed. The product was delivered on time, on budget, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and we were all very happy about it. We are creating an economy that's based on the lack of understanding, and that's wrong. But it takes, like Hu was saying, and, and I'm sorry, I'm just reiterating what you're saying. You're doing a much better job too. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Would it be fair to say you guys could hear Alberta in the back? Don't need to, so let me just add something to the thing she added to what I said a moment ago. One of the reasons I have this approach and, and attitude about jargon is before Alberta was working with the CDC, about a dozen years ago, I was consulting for the CDC. And uh, mostly successfully, but it went south. Uh, when I ended up getting in the room with the senior decision maker who, uh, like many people at the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, is a, a very high level healthcare professional, a doctor, and very proud of that, and he should be. But uh, in certain fields, and that often is one, uh, the jargon is really important. The being the member of the priesthood is really important. And I didn't want to play that game. And he was trying to actually show me that he knew my jargon better than I did. And I wasn't ready for that. And so I basically, you know, I was, I was gone actually about a, a couple weeks later. That was pretty much the end of a, a year and a half gig once we had that difference of uh, opinion about the importance of jargon. And, and so in some respects, my whole approach here is in reaction to that. And thanks for bringing up this really bad memory. I hadn't thought about it. <laughs> Sorry, chicken wire. Chicken wire, I should, that's the well, chicken wire approach. You, you did do therapy. <laughs> Am I the most neurotic person to ever speak and interact? Do we have time for any more questions? Because uh, I'd be happy to take a few. Any more questions? Good people of interact. What about the bad people? Oh, uh, Angel's got one. Hi, I just, just wanted to say I loved your talk. <laughs> so you. many of the ideas that I brought up, you had you taken them to the next dimension. So I left us with an opportunity and a challenge. And, You've shown me how to take the next step. But I do have a question, and I'm very much on this page now. I am seeking senior level kind of sponsorship of this idea of going across the silos and trying to get everybody at the same table. But I loved your example of actually doing it a little bit under the radar, perhaps, or maybe going directly to research other, the silos of other research teams because I expect they would be more open because it's in their interest to share, etc. Do you think senior level sponsorship or interest is important in Absolutely. this? Or you think I should do that? Okay. I think in, in general you have to take an approach of triangulation. Um, you want to do both. You have to be telling the story to people uh, at, at the sort of grassroots level like uh, Samantha Stormer was doing with her candy. Um, and uh, the, but then what she could do was go talk to the senior people and present the situation on the ground of collaboration as already being normal 
was like she's, she normalized it before it even really came up to the senior level, which is really great. Yeah. Um, but the senior level uh, conversation is a tough one. And I think uh, what's really important is to know the psychology of, of your senior people before you even get into the room. Uh, my CDC example is one where I just wasn't ready for the psychology. I didn't really explore it well. I should have been. Uh, so learn from my mistake. But um, I think, you know, if you, if you can, you might find that it, they'll go along with things because those things may already be happening. Can you present it as a fait accompli? Mm -hmm. Or they may be going along with ideas that they can present as their own. Can you take their language and mm -hmm. sort of tweak it in a way to make it sound like their idea. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of other approaches that people take. I bet you have a few up your own sleeve. Well, I was thinking, yes, trying that kind of thing, yeah. But oh. it's very much about so limited time and how do I sell this as an idea really quickly well, and really persuasively. I, I want to just bring this up one more time really quickly. Look, there it is. Yes, I think they'd love this. This idea of blue sky, mm. uh, I mean, you know, this, the, the idea that we're not talking about research groups, we're not talking about things that are already in place, but to reframe it as how should we as an organization make big decisions and what evidence can we use? In other words, the idea of design this from scratch in an idealized way and then compare to the reality of the dog's breakfast, I think is a good approach. So that's another thing I would encourage, to look to reframe it as decision making for the organization, as the organizational brain. Sounds great. I'll do that. Will I, people, please put your hands together for the Nimitz Board. Thank you.